Yeah, and of course, I mean, I'll I'll let you whatever. <clears throat> like so, for instance, because I'm I'm unfortunately busy. If you have um, if you have stuff that I'm doing that for whatever reason strikes your fancy, and you want to write about it, um, I am more than happy to give you the scoop, right, of what is going on, um, so that you have, you know, first shot at some of these things. So, you know, just let me know. I'm more than happy to help you. Okay. And I was thinking maybe it'd be cool if I just asked you a little about, like, how you first started uh, ideas and, like, what your work is, just, like, briefly so that I can of course. post that. <clears throat> of course. So uh, are, are, am I recording now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Wonderful. So uh, my name is Clayton Lewis Ferrara. Today is the 6th of July, uh, 2017, and it is uh, about 11, 18 uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, so I did not start Ideas for Us, uh, but uh, or rather the club, um, but I am responsible for uh, its direction uh, as executive director and also many of the goals that uh, we set to to uh, uh, to complete. So I met Chris Castro, who is the founder of Ideas, uh, in the summer of 2011. And uh, actually, it was, it was spring of 2011. Um, Chris was still a student at the University of Central Florida, and uh, he started a club called Ideas which stood for Intellectual Decisions on Environmental Awareness Solutions, and was written in all caps with dots in between it. And this club uh, at UCF was totally action-based. So planting gardens, cleaning up trash on campus, helping out retention ponds, uh, and being an active uh, voice, organizing people against shit the college wanted to do. Uh, like demolish the last forested area on campus and turn it into a parking garage. So um, it was an active, uh, active club. And uh, at that time, I was the head curator uh, and executive director of a nature preserve. It's called the Oakland Nature Preserve. And um, professionally, I'm a biologist. So I studied biology and uh, I have a self-taught background in museum curation and building educational experiences for people that uh, kind of intertwine them uh, with nature from children all the way through adults. And uh, at this nature center, I understood the importance of having lots and lots and lots of different groups and people and things. And we opened up the nature preserve for um, uh, a, a organization called the Florida Wildlife Foundation. Uh, to or Florida Wildlife Federation, pardon me, Florida Wildlife Federation, one of the oldest uh, environmental organizations in Florida. They're 80 years old, and um, some of the people there are 82, and um, they are uh, a wonderful old-school group of champions for Florida. These are the kinds of people who made sure Ocala was a uh, national forest that made sure that Wakaiva Springs didn't get turned into development and, and fought to make these things state parks. So a great group of people, they invited ideas from UCS to come to the meeting and to talk about their battle to save the, what's called the Arboretum from the parking garage. And uh, this is where I met Chris and uh, a couple of other students uh, as well. And we really hit it off and, um, you know, felt that, uh, this club concept uh, could be much grander and could, you know, help people, uh, you know, on, on a greater scale and be more transplantable. Um, so we came together as friends and uh, we sat down and said, well, let's come up with a structure for this and a focus, right? Our focuses became something called the five pillars of sustainability. And that's energy, water, food, waste, and ecology. We made up the term. We made up the ones on the list and uh, kind of formulated that. Um, then we said, well, this should be a nonprofit. And uh, 
I was the only one of the group that had run nonprofits and set them up before. So I filled out our paperwork and got that filed and got ourselves approved and became a nonprofit and um, started learning everything that goes into that uh, as we went along. And uh, it was really exciting. Um, the, our early years are some of the most uh, exciting uh, times of, of my life so far. Um, but now things are a little different and uh, we're much more aware of everything. We're much more structured. We have a, a, a brick and mortar office. We're not just working out of dorm rooms and coffee shops and the backseat of speeding cars with Wi-Fi tethering and, you know, uh, and, 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 uh, so, you know, we do get a lot of that from time to time. So I was just going around Rwanda and, uh, and, and had a lot of that. So it, it brings me back to, to our early days. Um, but you know, when it comes down to it, we are, uh, a 21st century environmental organization. And what that means is that we want to be, uh, completely inclusive for all voices uh, in the environment, um, people of color, people in the LGBT spectrum, especially women. I'm very happy to say that in 2015, I set goals to particularly hire women in our organization, provide jobs for them, elevate them to positions of leadership. And uh, I am a minority of uh, being male uh, in our organization um, because we happen to have extraordinary uh, female uh, leaders in different programs and and outreach efforts and things like that. So I'm very proud of that. I think that's super important. Um, and we speak for many different issues, but our, our underlying principle of forwarding action, education, and awareness, um, you know, are, are throughout everything that we do. Um, so my job is I'm the executive director, and what that means is I handle our development, our fundraising, and also our strategy. Uh, and how we're going to achieve our mission. Uh, and our mission is to develop fund and scale solutions that solve the most pressing environmental and social challenges of our time. So what that really means is we are helping people all over the world to solve their own problems. We are not coming in with savior complex to save everyone with our knowledge that we have from our uh, high ivory tower uh, colleges or anything like that. Um, we are going down into the places where people need us the most and we are communicating with them of what they feel their needs are and then coming up with ways that they can help meet those needs themselves. So there is a lot of motivational speaking. There's a lot of self-empowerment. There's a lot of technical support uh, that goes into these things. Then once we come up with good projects, we fund them. And uh, so much of the money that we raise uh, goes directly into projects, uh, like over 85%, um, which is extraordinary. Um, we're on the top tier of organizations that turn over, you know, the donations that we get directly into projects. So we have very little overhead uh, as an organization, which is great and um, something we are constantly uh, trying to streamline because um, we really believe in, in, in doing these projects. And then we measure the shit out of them. We, we create our own metrics, our own indicators. Uh, is this working? Is this not? Is this building equity for people? Is this empowering women? Is this something that is increasing biodiversity? Uh, is it something that's maybe shrinking biodiversity if you have an area that's full of invasive species? Um, or an area that is being restored to being not particularly biologically rich because not every habitat is full of many, many, many different species. We have to make those kinds of decisions. Um, luckily, um, by being at the helm of an organization, many people who are executive directors of nonprofits uh, have business degrees um, or have uh, you know, degrees in, in, in law or or other similar types of things. I'm very proud that I'm a biologist and that I'm in this uh, C-level executive role because those important decisions, like what I just mentioned, uh, we luckily, uh, it has to pass through me. And if it's not biologically uh, logical or is going to make a positive 
impact or benefit, we don't do it. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then the last part of develop, fund, and scale is scale. And that's really the fun part. Um, we've done action projects in over 20 different countries around the world. Um, we have offices in Orlando, Florida, in Pokhara, P-O-K-R-A-H-A, -A, Nepal, um, uh, Monrovia, Liberia. And uh, we're, we're figuring out where our office in Uganda is moving. It may be moving from Kampala to a place called Kasisi. We don't, we don't quite know yet. Um, but these are hubs that we have for action around the world. <laughs> And that's really exciting. Um, and we are able to travel to these places and, and do work. Recently, I was in Rwanda and um, was working on a wonderful project there. Um, Rwanda faced a horrific genocide. And um, over, a, over a million people were killed in 100 days uh, by hand. Really terrible shit. And... Um, what they have done in the last uh, 23 years since this genocide is truly extraordinary. Um, they have put themselves back together tremendously well, not swept the tragedy under the rug, but completely owned it. Um, even people who were perpetrators in it, in town uh, hall meetings, would stand up and confess, yes, I hacked my extra neighbors to death with a machete. What should happen to me? And then they debate whether the relatives that have survived either forgive the person and embrace them and move on, or do they serve jail time? Do they serve as a servant to help the family, um, you know, tend to their needs uh, because their loved ones are gone? all these kinds of things. They also put into their constitution that their parliament uh, must be 64% female. So there legally has to be a majority of women ruling over government in Rwanda now. Oh. And who would have thought that has made them one of the most successful countries in all of Africa. Uh, the UN came out with a report that stated that Rwanda is the number one place to be a woman in Africa. And uh, overall in the world, it's number six. Um, and this is because it's in place, guaranteeing women rights, guaranteeing them access to lines of credit in banks to be able to start their own businesses and invest, um, all kinds of things that are what we would call uh, affirmative action. Uh, have been placed uh, directly into play in Rwanda, and it has made them extremely successful. So we were there learning about this. We were there reaching out to villages that are still in need of help, that are very remote, still struggle with projects uh, or uh, with uh, problems um, that we can come up with projects about. Um, these are things like food insecurity. These are things like climate change. These are things like uh, coming up with a comprehensive sustainability plan for their city. Um, these are areas that we're experts in. And uh, we are really making headway here in Orlando and making it one of the most sustainable cities in the country uh, and in turn the world. And um, we're, we're really uh, dedicated to doing that. And there's many, many, many things on the horizon here uh, and a plan that's been executed here in Orlando for the last 10 years that we have as a uh, guide to share with people in Rwanda. And that plan is called the Greenworks Plan. And um, so many different things are happening that are really exciting. But when it comes down to it, what we do as ideas for us is we want people all over the world to uh, either start a club or a hive, uh, which is free. A hive is a community uh, setting. For it, club exists inside of a university or college or high school, and from that we help them come up with action projects, develop them, fund them, and scale them. So I'll shut up now and turn over to any questions you have. Okay. Um, well, that answered quite a bit of the questions I had. <laughs> um, cool. <clears throat> that's definitely more than I ever knew about your organization. 
Mm -hmm. Um, hmm, Questions. As I said, I didn't really plan many questions, and you just answered a lot of things. Um, I was okay. curious just like exactly how much of your time is spent traveling to other countries. Um, not as much as I would like, um, but uh, a good amount. I would say that probably 20% of my time is spent in the field. Um, now, if I was a field biologist, that's a shameful amount. Um, but as an executive, that's pretty good. And uh, this is traveling around places in Florida to talk about what it is we do and teach, um, and then also abroad uh, as well. Um, in the United States, there's some hubs for this kind of thing. It's really amazing. Orlando is certainly a hub for sustainability. Lots of people traveling here to talk and to work in sustainability-based things. Of course, New York, a major hub there, and Washington, D.C., uh, are places I, I travel semi-often. Uh, meaning at least a couple times a year. Uh, I routinely speak at the UN every February and every August. So I know February and August I'll be in New York uh, at the UN headquarters, and it's because we are uh, part of the UN, and they have uh, UN youth uh, in particularly related uh, programs there. And for us, that is one of the most important groups we can speak to because young people of the future and giving them a chance earlier and earlier and earlier to problem solve, understand the many different forces at work that continue to create problems for them in their community and learning how to solve them uh, is, is so important. So the earlier that we can get people having that kind of experience, the better. Um, so there's those types of things. There's other conferences that are sometimes abroad. Um, I, I will say this though, we do certainly have self-control on where we go. Um, it is a polluting action to fly on a plane. Um, unless we are going somewhere and doing some kind of environmental work where we are organizing or we're planting trees or we're taking part in a, a meeting where our influence needs to be there so that laws and goals are created from that after the fact, then we usually don't go. Um, there are some people who work for the UN who their life is literally flying from meeting to meeting. Egypt to Chicago to South America to fucking Australia, and they are permanently traveling uh, forever, you know, going to these meetings. To us, that's a waste. Right. And um, we don't want to um, pollute things, especially with technology, right? You can Skype with someone Many of these meetings are televised. This may be something cool that uh, you want to share in this blog or future blogs is that many people think that the UN is this thing that's like not accessible, it's like the world government that the U.S. set up after World War II, right? So World War I happens. We then form this thing called the League of Nations, and the League of Nations fails at stopping World War II. So afterwards, we go back to the drawing board and we're like, well, shit, this didn't fucking work. Why not? Well, it would just involve some nations and not a worldwide effort. So what if we literally made a united league of every nation and we'll call it the United Nations? And that's exactly what we did. And um, it is surprisingly transparent. It is surprisingly televised. Most conferences of the UN, you can go on to the UN Facebook or, or um, pardon me, UN YouTube channel, and you can watch these conferences happening from wherever you are. Uh, very often they have them with links to other UN groups like UN Women and Children or UN Environment or UN Economic Development or UN Stopping uh, Chemical Weapons. And you can follow those channels on YouTube. You literally get a ping to your phone when a meeting is happening because they happen at all kinds of crazy hours because they're in different countries. And um, from there, you can watch them. And, uh, and that's something that I wish more people participated in because you'll see some of these things that are like literally determining the levels of gases that are considered a terrorist act in war. 
and the video has like 32 views. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, they're, they're, it's the kind of thing that like, you know, p- people in, in the general public should, should, should take, take attention to because then what they can do to organizations like Ideas for Us, where we're what's called an NGO. An NGO is what an organization is called internationally. It's what the rest of the world profit. The word nonprofit is just in the United States because nonprofit just uh, uh, refers to a tax code. So uh, the saying, the only thing in life that's certain is death and taxes, right, is uh, in, in the aspect of the United States, um, they define different companies by what tax bracket they're in. And a nonprofit means that we are an entity that exists for the purpose of not just making a profit. So think about that. That means every other company or organization out there is registered that their only purpose for existing whatsoever is to make money. And by being a nonprofit, it doesn't mean that you don't make money, right? We ha- I have to bring in a tremendous amount of money uh, in order to run our programs and projects and pay our staff. Um, but uh, in, in order to do that, uh, we are not guided by the pursuit of just money. We're guided by a mission to do good in the world, and that makes us a quote-unquote non-profit organization. So the rest of the world calls this an NGO, which stands for non-governmental organization, because in many other countries, the only organizations that are out there are governments. Um, So we are a non-governmental organization, which is kind of seen as a neutral neutral entity. We're on neither side of political parties. We're on neither side of governments. We are totally neutral, working on whatever our respective mission may be. And uh, the way that the general public has their voice heard at the UN is through NGOs. So by us being part of the UN, people can say to us, hey, I'm pissed about X, Y, Z, or I want logging to stop in Peru. Why the hell isn't the international community doing anything about that? We can then put together a formal document, submit it to the UN, and it has to be read up to 2,000 words to the uh, governing bodies there. And it is a direct line of having our voice and concerns heard. So that's a really exciting thing that we're able to bring people who uh, support us and are interested in us and and those kinds of things. Yeah, that's definitely not something I was aware of, which is neat because I could kind of keep up with things and do something even though I'm disabled and not really able to travel around and be active physically. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the internet is a really magical invention. Um, And, it would be great if people learned how they can use it efficiently to forward their things they care about, right? Whether someone cares about endangered species or uh, equality laws or uh, health care or whatever it is, to realize that whether you're sitting in an office in the Empire State Building in New York, right, as, as an elite few, in your office, your ass is still on a computer and you're still fucking emailing people. And that when you think about it, that computer can be anywhere in the world. It's just knowing who to speak with, how to network, uh, how to stay involved, uh, and those kinds of things. And it's pretty surprising how um, easy and accessible uh, a lot of things in the UN are. Um, because it has that influence of so many other countries and net neutrality, uh, which is so important that, um, you know, all the people's names and phone numbers and emails at these meetings are listed. You can call them up and, uh, and, and have your voice heard that way. So that's a really cool thing. And um, more people should definitely know all about that. I agree. Okay, um, so I'm not sure that I exactly have um, any other questions. I might ask you for some things online. 
Um, sure. Uh, and, some some cool stuff that you could check out is if you just go to our website, ideasforus.org, and you click on About, on that page, there's a couple buttons. One is like a timeline of stuff we've done. The other is to download our strategic plan. Uh, you can click those buttons, and uh, those are really good resources of stuff uh, that has just happened, you know, um, in the past. Um, if you go into our blog area, which is news and media and search around, we're coming up with a much better interface soon. We've been working a lot on the website behind the scenes and we'll make all those changes go live soon. But um, there's a document in there called the top 16 of 2016. And uh, every year we come out with, uh, you know, like here's the cool shit we did this past year. And uh, so that'll be in there. And um, yeah, I think those are good resources to start with. Okay. Um, I might also uh, try and get some pictures and things to accompany the blog. Yeah, you can feel free to use anything you want. I mean, you could just go onto our Facebook page at Ideas for Us. Okay. And uh, you can feel free to pull anything that you want off of there. And are um, you okay so, with me, like, taking some of the audio and posting that along with the blog? Of course, you can do whatever you want. Okay, because I'm going to try to have uh, some of the interview so they can listen to you and then pictures and then write more about it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in that case, I'd like to just say a couple other quick things. Um, if someone wants to get involved with ideas for us, uh, it's very easy to do so. I invite you to email us at contact at ideasforus.org. That's the easiest way uh, to get a hold of us and let us know what some of your thoughts are, where you are, who you are, why you are, what is it that you want to bring to the environmental movement? And also, maybe you don't know. Maybe you're looking for causes that need your help uh, and, and you're looking for a way to find that. We can also help point you in the right direction. Um, as a way of organizing, we have documents called toolkits it's basically a glorified PDF, um, but we send them out to you. And uh, through that, you're able to learn some organizing skills, how to build a community of people um, around uh, coming up with different action projects, how to plan uh, an environmental action day, um, those kinds of things. And also how to apply for funding from us. Um, we have the Solutions Fund, which is our micro-granting uh, program. And that opens up every quarter, and we give out funds for projects. Unfortunately, we can't fund all of them, um, but um, people who apply have a, have a pretty good shot. We have a committee um, of some very skilled people, sociologists, and, and uh, you know, people who've really dealt with, with projects that we've done over the years uh, in, in C2, uh, which is in the field. And... Um, uh, it's a it's a wonderful program. Right now we're funding. Uh, we're just about to have the checks go out um, this week, and we're funding a, a pig farm in Uganda for women to be able to create income for their children to send them to school. Um, we're funding a small scale solar installation um, in Somalia. We are um, uh, planting trees in Togo. Uh, all kinds of really great stuff. And um, also an anti-sickle, or a, a, well, not anti, but it, it's anti-discrimination against people who have sickle cell anemia and uh, helping to bring programs uh, about sickle cell anemia, malaria, and those types of things to, to schools. So these are real people who applied for our program. Their projects were selected. We're going to, you know, continue to meet with them over Skype routinely, uh, which is amazing, and uh, really build friendships with them, help them, um, you know, not just with money, but with also support and, and get these metrics back from them, see what works, what doesn't, and hopefully we'll find something that works really well, addresses a lot of the sustainable development goals uh, that are out there, and uh, then we can identify, like, okay, for this input of X amount of dollars, here's the impact we had. Here's why the impact was successful, we believe, 
what are other communities that have similar uh, variables, and let's deploy money there, see if we can have an even greater impact. Um, and then once those types of things work, then we can really make a, a significant investment of tens or, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars into a large scale program to make a very big impact at a, at a, a county wide or even country wide level. Um, so those are all um, easy ways to get involved with us. Okay, and uh, there are definitely some really active in environmentalists on Steemit, so I'll try to get this blog to some people personally. And Cool, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's really extraordinary, and um, I'm, uh, I'm honored to, uh, to have you had thought of me. And uh, just know anything else you'd like to write about, whether it's you know, a follow-up blog on a specific project, maybe fleet farming uh, and what's going on there. That's one of our most famous projects that we created. Fleet farming is a urban pedal-powered agricultural food system. Basically what that means is people on bicycles are turning front lawns into gardens. They are growing food and not lawns. They're sharing the food with the homeowner uh, for free as a way of eradicating food deserts and the rest of the garden, what the homeowner can't eat because these gardens are huge and densely packed with food. No one has been able to even eat 30% of their garden. And uh, that's awesome. And the rest of it winds up going to market. Um, goes to market where people have very little access to food. Goes to market where they can use EBT or SNAP benefits. Uh, and we're in a program where those benefits are doubled. Um, so they have access to healthy, fresh, organic produce that's locally grown in a hyper-local fashion by community volunteers. And uh, it's, it's a really exciting program. We're bringing it to one of the worst food deserts in the country, uh, which happens to be here in Orlando, in Paramore. And uh, we're going to be scaling it there uh, next month in August. We're going to be breaking ground. Uh, of putting in farms there. Okay. And you can find out more about that program specifically at Fleet Farming, F L E E T Farming uh, dot com. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks. And I think that's about all I all I need for the interview. I am on the website now and I'm going to go ahead and look over and try to create a pretty in-depth blog about ideas. Cool. So, well, thank you so much. You're, you're so great. If you have any other questions, just write me and uh, just know I'm always here. This phone number, like I said, I've had since 1998. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks awesome a lot. Work. And I'll let you know when the blog's up. It might it might actually be tonight. I tend to kind of work for hours and hours. So if I cool. get it up tonight, I'll yeah. send it to you. Or if not, it might be like tomorrow. Yeah, take your time. Do your thing. And uh, thank you so much. You're the best. Okay, thank you. Of course. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.